Don't you get sick of the Israel lobby trying to get us into more war in the Middle East? Or always abusing Palestinians with your tax dollars? It once seemed like the lobby would always have full-spectrum dominance on the foreign policy discussion in D.C. But those days are over. The Council for the National Interest is the America Lobby, standing up and pushing back against the Israel Lobby's undue influence on Capitol Hill. Go show some support at councilforthenationalinterest.org. That's councilforthenationalinterest.org. All right, you guys, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. Up next is Abdi Ismaili Samatar, a professor of geography at the University of Minnesota, and a research fellow at the University of Pretoria. He's also the president of the African Studies Association. He's got this important article at aljazeera.com. It's called The Nairobi Massacre and the Genealogy of the Tragedy. Welcome to the show, Abdi. How are you doing? Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to be with you. Good, good. Uh, very happy to have you here on the show. And uh, happy to have someone on uh, who's uh, fluent in this subject of the the recent war and going back a decade in Somalia. So uh, we got about basically two 10-minute segments. So uh, is it okay if we start with, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, 2005, I guess, if you want, or, or in fact, maybe even the intervention leading up to uh, the declaration of the Islamic Courts Union and then the Ethiopian invasion in response and then we can get to more current subject matter. Sure, that uh, that's yeah. fine with me. Sure. Okay, so go ahead. So take us back to, I guess, if you want, the dawn of the war on terrorism or uh, whenever you think is apt. You know, I think the place to begin is 1991 when the country's government collapsed. And they never had a government uh, covering the entire ter- ter- territory since 1991. There are factional leaders here and there. There are regimes here and there but not a sort of a country, a government that uh, controls its territory fully and that's accountable to its people. Uh, The failure of that government or the collapse of that government was uh, induced by two forces, Uh, local forces, uh, Somalis themselves, and certain elements of the political elite in that country who wanted to use the state or the government for their own ends rather than for the serving the interests of the population. And the second force was the rivalry between what was then the Soviet Union and the United States. And so the Cold War put a lot of weaponry into that country, first by the Soviets and then by us later on. And so the people began to realize that nobody was serving their interests and began to move against the regime. Uh, And the regime brutalized people and killed hundreds of thousands of people uh, for several years. Then the country collapses, and then warlords, as we know them, took over the country. And because some of the warlords were using food as a weapon against hapless people, they caused a famine that killed 300,000 people. In 1992, President George Bush Sr. couldn't, I guess, stomach the brutality of these warlords and sent, I think, over 20,000 American forces to open up the road so that food food aid can get to sort of a hungry people. Uh, The project uh, narrowly defined to get the food to the people was successful and averted what could have been even a worse catastrophe. But what our government and the military we had on the ground did not do is to help Somalis who were interested to put their country back together and produce a government that was accountable to its population. Then we had a Black Hawk down, and we withdrew from that. And then for uh, up to about 1997, we didn't do pay much attention to the country. And then, of course, in 1997-98, our embassies in Nairobi, Kenya, and in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, were bombed by terrorists from Al-Qaeda. Some of those terrorists were said to have passed through Somalia to get to Kenya and Tanzania. Then our attention began to change, and we began to focus on this. To make a long story short, the warlords who ran people's lives through tyranny, uh, brutalizing, raping, maiming, killing, and whatnot, for almost a decade and a half, were chased out of town in Mogadishu in 2006 by a group called the Union of the Islamic Courts. This was a ramshackle of a group, Islamic uh, people, who were not warlords themselves, who were not fanatics themselves, who were not radicals themselves, 
<clears throat> but who were pained by the plight of their people. And so once they chased the warlords out of town, the country became peaceful all over again, without any intervention from outside. Unfortunately, junior President George W. Bush was convinced by the Ethiopian government that these Union of the Islamic Courts were a cover for terrorists. And it's that which then began what we see today as the tyranny of al-Shabaab, both in Somalia and in Kenya, which led to the massacre in Garissa uh, three weeks ago, where 145 uh, uh, students in a university were massacred by war law, by terrorists. Mm -hmm. All right, now, uh, I definitely want to get back to that in just a minute, but if we could rewind just a little bit there. Uh, I've read before, uh, it, but is it right that preceding the creation of the Islamic Courts Union, that really, uh, right after September 11th, at least in 2002, 2003, that the Americans started paying off the warlords who were including Adid's son, uh, the, the bad guy from the Black Hawk Down episode, and hiring these secularist-seeming warlords as long as they were promising to hunt down Islamists for us. And that was what really led to the solidification of the Islamic Courts Union against the warlords in the first place. Like I think the way I learned it was, as you said, that the, the locals had diminished the power of the warlords already. But then when the Americans came and started backing the warlords, that was when the real fight broke out, and that was really what led to the creation of the ICU in the first place in, in, uh, you know, against the warlords. And then that became the excuse for the next intervention. Oh, no, now we got to get rid of the Islamic Courts Union. Is that correct? I think that's an excellent reading of what transpired. All right, good. Well, I'm glad we're straight on that. So yeah. then when the Ethiopian, so then it's uh, Christmas 2006. Take us to what happened then. Well, then the, the, our government uh, tacitly gave the green light for the Ethiopians to move in against the Union of the Islamic Courts, which they did with logistical support from Britain and the United States, particularly satellite imagery of where troops, Somali troops were at. Uh, Ethiopians captured Mogadishu, uh, displaced about a million people uh, in 2000, from December 2006 uh, through 2008. Uh, bombed Mogadishu like there was no tomorrow and destroyed much of whatever literal infrastructure of the country existed at that point in time. And then the, the Union of the Islamic Courts dispersed and, uh, and Somali people began to support the resistance movement against the Ethiopians. And the toughest group in that resistance movement was what was then called the Youth Wing of the Union of the Islamic Courts, or what we know today as al-Shabaab. And the Somalis supported al-Shabaab because they were the only ones who could stand up against the Ethiopians and ultimately push them out of the country. Uh, now, so in other words, al-Shabaab is basically, in reality, what the Americans pretended to be fighting when they hired the Ethiopians to invade in 06. Is that, that right? That's correct, but al-Shabaab was not a terrorist organization from our vantage point uh, when uh, the Ethiopians invaded. And uh, we designated al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization in the spring of 2008. And, uh, and what they originally were fighting was to get rid of the Ethiopians in their country. And, and how long uh, was it before they declared their allegiance to Ayman al-Zawahiri or Bin Laden? I think it was about, you know, just about that time. Uh, they did that declaration just before we declared them as a terrorist organization. But after the invasion by the Ethiopians? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. There was no affiliation as far as we can tell. In fact, the young man who was the head of the, uh, the al-Shabaab, although he was trained in Afghanistan, he had no religious training whatsoever and made no claims about that. I personally met him when I was in Mogadishu in 2006, and I was astonished by the, his sort of a lack of knowledge about Islam itself. Mm -hmm. And then isn't it the case that after they – oh, man, you know what? We don't have time for this. We'll, we'll get back to this uh, on the other side of the break because it's too big of a question to ask there. But I guess here's what we could talk about um, – would be the the fact that they seem like, you know, they were smeared as being, if not al-Qaeda, at least the Taliban, because they were closing movie theaters and stuff like that. But it seemed like they didn't even have the amount of power required to be a truly authoritarian government, the ICU, before the invasion, I mean. They, no, I, I think that you are right. I think they were sufficient enough to chase the warlords and liberate the population from the terror of the warlords. 
uh, over time they could very well have become sort of an authoritarian regime. Mm. But Ethiopia is an authoritarian regime, and we are able to provide them with uh, <laughs> military and material support. Sure. The question is not whether it's an authoritarian right. I'm sorry, or not. We gotta stop. We gotta, we'll be right back, everybody. It's okay. Abdi Samantar, aljazeera.com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. All right, guys. Welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. It's my show, The Scott Horton Show. I'm talking with Abdi Samatar. He's a professor at the University of Minnesota. He wrote this thing for AlJazeera.com, the Nairobi Massacre and the Genealogy of the Tragedy. Of course, it's the American Empire's fault. Uh, the strongest power in the history of the world, picking on the weakest, smallest, little helpless, most helpless country in the history of the world here, basically. Uh, what it seems to shake out to. Now, I'm sorry, at the point we were interrupted at the break, you were saying, yeah, you know, they didn't have uh, the Islamic Courts Union that Bush intervened to overthrow in 06. They didn't have enough actual raw power to enforce any kind of authoritarianism. They might have been some kind of Taliban light if they had even had the opportunity to be, but they never really had the strength to even be that. And then I think you were in the middle of saying when I interrupted you, sorry about that, uh, something along the lines of, even if they were, then what? Talk, right? Instead of bombing them? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the Ethiopians bombed them, and uh, and then the, our government, with the help of the Europeans, uh, installed a new regime, a new government, a new president in Mogadishu. Uh, the head of that government was the former leader of the Union of the Islamic Courts, who have now become a tan coat uh, going against his old comrades, if you like. Uh, and then al-Shabaab then went literally belly up and got, went crazy and began to do the kind of stuff that we now associate with them, suicide bombings, attacking people, civilians, and others alike. And then so we had a hand in the, if you like, in the making of what we know today as the terrorist group al-Shabaab, which has killed those students, which firebombed uh, the shopping mall, uh, Westgate in Nairobi, uh, has done numerous other things in Uganda and so on and so forth. What this all of this tell us, that if we are not deliberate enough and thoughtful enough about our strategy in that part of the world or any part of the world, and are very serious about accountability and democratic governments by the local populations, this is the sort of thing that will be the sort of a, have the uh, will come back at us and haunt us to the point where Al Shabaab has been recruiting from Minnesota. We are told uh, ISIS is recruiting from Minnesota. We are told, but we have to know rather than just engaging in a firefight, how is our policy? Is our policy intelligent enough to ensure that there is a win-win situation for the local people and for our interests? Mm -hmm. Well, Where there strong... is no such a win-win situation, then you will have people like al-Shabaab and ISIS and others. Mm -hmm. Well, how strong is al-Shabaab now? Because we're, we're skipping ahead of quite not... a few years here. but No, al-Shabaab has been sort of forced out of all the major towns and cities in Somalia. But they can almost hit anywhere at their own choice and at their time. So they can become lethal in the sense of going into a university, rounding up the students, and then brutally massacring them. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can sort of uh, walk into a shopping mall and do the same sort of thing. Well, what if all the foreign troops under the African Union, are the Burundians and the Ethiopians, and I, I guess I know in your article you say the Kenyans are still there, are they all still there? And then what if they left? They are all still there, and we, the American government and the European Union, uh, provide resources and support them fully to the tune of several hundred million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. We pay very little attention to Somali security forces. And my uh, sort of a basic understanding is that we can uh, sort of uh, train and mobilize 20,000 Somali security forces at fraction of the cost that the African Union force costs today to our taxpayers. 
and still be get a much more effective security force that's accountable to its people, Somalis, that is, and that will literally drive al-Shabaab to the sea. Mm. We are not doing that. And the recent visit by our Secretary of State, Mr. Kerry, to Somalia was a window dressing to a problem that nobody seems to want to address. Now, I mean, is there actually uh, a chance that the government that's been created by the Americans and their cohorts uh, to to rule Somalia, the quote unquote government, that that really that that same state could, you know, end up uh, healing the rifts and representing the people, as you say, or, you know, maybe a, a better solution would be for America and its puppet powers to just back off and let the Somalis work it out themselves. Rather than well, I think Somalis, Somalis will need help from outside world, <clears throat> but the kind of help they need is has to be genuine help. And Somalis, are, you know, there are a large number of Somalis in the United States who are happy here. Somalis see questions of democracy and development as something they are deeply committed and interested in. So they were going to need help to recover from this war. But the regime in Mogadishu is as corrupt as you can get. Transparency International. Uh, rank them number one in the world as the most corrupt regime in the world. Wow. You can't expect that kind of a regime Worst to deliver America. goods and services and leadership for its own population. We have to move this one out and help Somalis select and elect a government that reflects their hopes and dreams. The day we do something to that effect, and the Somalis will have to walk the talk themselves, mm-hmm. then I think we can find partners in that part of the world who respect themselves and respect their people and who are willing to legitimately work with the international community on a mutual basis rather than subservient basis. Mm -hmm. Well, now, very importantly, you write in your article that the Kenyan forces, and particularly in the town of Kismayo uh, on the shore there, that they are really creating their own little fiefdom there with their own warlord that they're supporting, and they refuse to work with the government of Mogadishu. Sounds like there might be a lot of good reason why they wouldn't want to work with the government of Mogadishu, but it doesn't sound like it's the good reasons <laughs> are the reasons why that they won't. It you know there, it sounds like they're breaking off their own little mini state. Uh, That's little correct. Um, that I mean the Ethiopians are doing the same thing elsewhere. Uh, I mean Kenya uh, is one of the most corrupt states in 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 the African continent and uh, I mean uh, Nigeria leads uh, that score after Somalia but Kenya is is high high on the rank of some of the most corrupt regimes in the world uh, by Transparency International they are not interested in helping Somalis put their Humpty Dumpty back together they are interested to use that region which they occupy now as a buffer zone but as also as a wedge to influence what becomes of Somalia in the future. This is what the Somali people completely reject and uh, and don't like. And al-Shabaab is using that uh, sort of a, as a pretext for its doing its own cruel deeds. Right. Yeah, war is the health of fighters everywhere, I guess. All right, well... Um... Listen, we're all out of time. I was, I'm actually keeping a little bit over time here, but uh, thanks very much for coming on the show. It's great to talk to you. With Appreciate pleasure, sir. Everybody, that is Abdi Samatar. He is a professor of geography at the University of Minnesota and a research fellow at the University of Pretoria and a member of the African Academy of Sciences. You can find him here at aljazeera.com, the Nairobi Massacre, and the Genealogy of the Tragedy. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for Liberty.me, the social network and community-based publishing platform for the liberty-minded. Liberty.me combines the best of social media technology all in one place and features classes, discussions, guides, events, publishing, podcasts, and so much more. And Jeffrey Tucker and I are starting a new monthly show at Liberty.me, Eye on the Empire. It's just 4 bucks a month if you use promo code SCOTT when you sign up. And hey, once you do, add me as a friend on there at scotthorton.liberty.me. Be free. Liberty.me. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it taste good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren'sCoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and you get free shipping. Darren'sCoffee.com. This part of the Scott Horton Show is sponsored by Audible.com. And right now, if you go to audibletrial.com slash Show, you can get your first audiobook for free. Of course, I'm recommending Michael Swanson's book, The War State. 
the Cold War origins of the military-industrial complex and the power elite. Maybe you've already bought the war state and paperback, but you just can't find the time to read it. Well, now you can listen while you're out marching around. Get the free audio book of The War State by Michael Swanson, produced by Listen and Think Audio at audibletrial.com slash Show.